leadership is acutely sensitive to context. We asked leaders in development to discuss how they have adapted their leadership approach to different contexts. So I think that this is a really classic issue in the sector, this tension that exists between the work that we need to do in country and in programs versus, I guess, the desires and the, the priorities of people who are donating to the organisation or the other stakeholders that we might have in Australia. Um, you know, it's, it's really tricky being an NGO worker in the middle because I think we often prioritise our work in a way that, that sells well to donors, in a way that makes people want to give more money to us. And the payoff for that means that we might have tired funding that can't be as flexible as we need it to be when we're working on programs. Or we might have you know, projects that are really stifled or really focused around a certain thematic area when we know that the best thing is for the program work to be flexible and for it to be community driven. I think that a really important way to combat that is to be a little bit more brave in the way that we advocate for this sort of program that we do need to have. And I guess trying to build donor understanding around, you know, what is good development work? It's not always clear. You don't always know the outcomes from the outset. You do need to be more flexible. But the payoff that we get for that in terms of better programs is so valuable. So we were having a problem that water and sanitation was poor, but people weren't doing much about it. Um, we did a report which showed that our water and sanitation work weren't working, people weren't taking responsibility, um, and we published that report and actually had a discussion with all the other organisations working in Tajikistan, both national and international, and everyone said, yes, we're having the same problem. You know, people aren't running m management committees, they're not looking after the wells, they're not looking after the water supplies, the state is very poor, you know, everything's, nothing's working. The breakthrough came because we had a sort of very, we had a sort of genius, natural leader, uh, a guy by the name of Ghazi, who was a Palestinian, who was our country director at the time. And he came up with a model where we convened and brokered, is the jargon we use now, where we get 17 government ministries all involved in water and sanitation in different ways, all the international community, the UN, the big donors, the NGOs, private sector, Tajikistan civil society, all in a room once every two months without an agenda. The agenda is, let's talk about water and sanitation. Ghazi keeps everybody happy because he's funny and sort of he's a water engineer, he knows what he's talking about. Um, people said that they looked us up on the website when they got the invitation, saw that Oxfam was an international organisation and therefore it wasn't going to have some big internal domestic agenda. So they thought, well, let's try this. And out of this conversation every two months, things started to emerge. So uh, somebody remembered that there was a draft water investment law, which they drafted and then never passed. They found it, they tidied it up a bit, and the president approved it. Um, the, all the different government ministries were so ashamed of the, of the lack of coordination that they set up an interministerial committee. That doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a really important way to make governments work efficiently uh, across uh, an issue like water and sanitation. And now we're starting to see more money going into water and sanitation, more investment, more civil society involvement. All of this could not have been predicted. All we did was create the forum where solutions to a complex system like why isn't water and sanitation working could emerge through the interaction and the building of trust between different players. And that's increasingly how we see the role of outsiders is creating those kind of spaces where solutions can emerge even when we haven't thought of them. So one of the crucial factors in the success of the project in Tajikistan was that we had a funder who agreed to fund this for 10 years. Because one of the problems about this kind of emergent adaptive leadership approach is you can't do it quick and you can't predict in advance what's going to happen. So I think the main constraint, one of the main constraints on this is our mental model of what aid is. Yes, ad adaptive um, leadership is, is important in international development contexts, particularly where you are seeking to bring together a range of different actors or organisations to address a, a shared challenge. A practical example for me was, was work I was involved in a number of years ago in Australia where uh, we brought together a range of organisations that had an interest in uh, health issues affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this was a process where we brought together gradually a range of organisations, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, uh, who all had interests in closing the gap, so to speak, in Indigenous health disadvantage, but had never necessarily worked together previously. And this was a process uh, that commenced with uh, just two organisations beginning to 
uh, to explore their capacity to work together. And then gradually over an 18-month period, bringing in up to 20 additional organisations that, that formed ultimately what became known as the Close the Gap campaign or coalition. And that was a, a gradual, very deliberate uh, trust building and consensus building process over time that built a consensus of views and trust between a range of organisations that had not necessarily worked together previously um, and who all recognised through the process the combined power of being able to work in an aligned way together. Mm -hmm. uh, that was done over a significant period of time and was critical, critical to the ultimate success of what became the Close the Gap campaign mm -hmm. in Australia, which has mobilised uh, millions of Australians towards uh, this outcome, has engaged state and federal governments at various levels, and to this day results in an annual progress statement and the first day of, of parliamentary sittings um, each, each year. So here we've got a situation where we're able to, to contribute to uh, what, what is uh, potentially transformative change through that gradual adaptive leadership. From my experience, so many, many years ago, I worked with this organization and I was in the manage, general management and our finance section, they were working manually. And by manually, I mean that they were using spreadsheets, but not a customizable financial software. And we realized that every organization around us is switching to that other concept, you know, where you use a, a financial software because it is more efficient, effective, it promotes transparency, and it is more accountable. So we decided that we need this. We need this. And how we did it, we hired a consultant. That consultant developed the software, he trained our staff, and he commissioned the software, and everything was fine. But right from the beginning, we were feeling problems. So the finance staff was not at all happy with the software. There were too many delays, too many errors, deadlines were missed, and they were blaming everything on the software. Even before a month, we had to roll back to our previous manual system. And then after a few months, you know, we thought about it, what went wrong, what, why every other organization is kind of adopting it and we are not. And this time we came up with a different solution. So we held meetings with the finance staff for about a week. We told them that this is the need, this is where we need to move, and your skills are not going redundant. Uh, your, still, your skills will, will st still serve a purpose as an oversight. I mean, there were people who were, you know, working with those skills for many, many years, and they felt like it was all going redundant in one day with the software. So we kind of worked with them closely, and then we, you know, developed a shared understanding of the problem, as you, have, as you call it. And this time, when this time we did not you know, switch to the financial software all at once. We did it for a couple of projects, then another one, then another one, and the you know, shift was gradual. And this time there was no problem. And this time it just worked fine. So yes, coming up, you, you know, we have this habit of making assumptions on other people's behalf. You know, that they're gonna be fine with it, they'll accept it. It doesn't work this way. You really have to work closely with people to develop a shared understanding. And you know, then, then you can hope that people will adapt to new changes. An adaptive leadership style, I think, is most relevant for complex emergency programs when things are, uh, uh, they're, they're disrupted at a very fast pace or on a very sudden level where, you were, where they were unforeseeable. So the example that I can share is uh, when I arrived in Jordan, and Zatri refugee camp at that time was a very small space. There were hardly 20, 30,000 people. And maybe you had a few families trickling in on a weekly basis. But uh, coincidentally, when I was there end of 2012 and early 2013, uh, the influx increased by, uh, I don't know, two or 300 percent on a daily basis. So you had at least five or 600 people getting to the camp every night or maybe in 12-hour uh, frequencies. 
And that required us all in my team and including even my boss to adapt our leadership style. So the first one, the thing was, as you were asking, that it, it does involve taking risks and experimenting because we were also unprepared for it. We had no idea, okay, this influx is gonna increase to a few families to 500 people a day. And what we need to do to help these people in that camp situation. On top of it, I remember there was a horrible snowstorm and people were, uh, wa weren't able to get tents or even one meal a day because the services were disrupted and the snowstorm obviously affected the logistics in the camp and the housing situation. So it became pretty chaotic. And there was violence almost on a daily basis. People rioting, uh, attacking NGO workers in the camp. So it was a very volatile situation. And the leadership that we adapted at that time was to look at the most core issues rather than focusing on long-term developmental programs, which we had plenty of funding for, which we had been working for for almost six, to, six months to a year. But the, but the focus became on immediate uh, life-saving services that were required in the camp so that the violence was quelled and we protected people from the horrible weather situation because of the snowstorm. Uh, and we can also cope with the huge volumes of people who were coming into the camp. Uh, so, so, the, so the change that happened, the adaption was that we figure out the logistics for the most immediate relief goods. We figure out people who we can even hire from the refugee communities and they can work with us to do the relief work rather than us as outsiders coming in and doing relief work. We also adapted our relationship with our donors, uh, something that I, I led on. Uh, in communicating globally with different donors and different partners and explaining to them how the situation is so complex and volatile that we cannot work in our standard developmental practices. So I think the adaptive leadership really needs to happen when you are faced with difficult situations and when there is truly life-saving work needed to be done.